everyone. I'm Joel Baker. I'm the director of the UW Puget Sound Institute, and you're not here to hear from me, so I'll be brief. I also just wanted to thank you all for joining us and say that this is the objective of this is extremely simple. That is just to get scientists together once, once a month to learn about new science and to reconnect with folks. And I hope to see some of you next week in Capitol Hill. And with that, I think I'll turn it over to Scott Redman, who's our host for this month's session. Yeah, thank you. And I'm going to be brief, too. Thanks very much to the Puget Sound Institute, Marielle, Joel, and others for creating this space. I'm glad to be able to, um, on occasion, bring um, items here. And when offered the opportunity, I really thought very quickly, let's hear from the Salish Sea Marine Survival Project, which is such a great example of transboundary collaboration and getting science to action. So I'll just turn it over to Liz and Isabel to take it from here. Thanks very much. Thanks so much for inviting us both. Um, thanks to the Puget Sound Institute and your co conveners the partnership and DFO. Thank you, Marielle, for organizing everything. My name is Isabel Pearsall. I'm the director of the Pacific Salmon Foundation's Marine Science Program. So I actually uh, live and work from Gabriola Island, which is the traditional territory of the Sinemuk First Nations, and uh, spend lots of time coming down to Seattle, um, where I think Liz is calling in from today. I'll just let Liz introduce herself. Hi, everyone. My name is Liz Duffy. I am a senior science project manager here at Long Live the Kings. Um, I've been here for just about two years now. And yes, as Isabel said, I am based in Seattle and very happy to be here with you today. Thanks, Liz. Just go to the next slide. So we're just uh, going to split up the presentation and I'm just going to give um, an overview of what we actually did during this project, the Salish Sea Marine Survival Project, which began in 2014 with a few years of preparation before that time. And uh, that ended really in 2021, I think, in terms of sort of final products. But as we will explain, we are carrying on the momentum and energy for, from that program forward to this day. Um, after the overview, I will speak to some of the, the sort of key findings, summarize those and some of the recommendations that came out of the, the project, and then hand over to Liz, and she's going to provide some of the highlights that came out of our 2023 workshop. Our transboundary team from the Salish Sea Project were reconvened we added a few new people at that point and kind of expanded the team and carried out this workshop. And so she's gonna talk about some of those featured updates on uh, the Salish Sea Project related work that was carried out. And since our program ended, we have been doing many, many different things. So she's gonna to speak to that and uh, what actions we're actually implementing on the ground and then what were the sort of outcomes from that workshop and our next steps that we're hoping to implement. Thanks, Liz. So with respect to the Salish Sea Marine Survival Project and on the left there, obviously the Salish Sea and our working area, the reason that we implemented this project was sort of the concern in the, you know, late, the sort of 2000s, we were starting to notice that there had been obviously this massive decline in Coho Chinook and steelhead populations. And the patterns of decline of marine survival were really quite different um, within the Salish Sea as compared to the outer coast. So I'm just gonna move something. And when we see those declines, they started in the 70s. They were pretty steep between the 80s and 90s. And they've really persisted to varying extents in these different populations through to the current day. And this very different pattern that was occurring within the Salish Sea really pointed to the fact that there's probably something happening in that early marine period when the fish are rearing within the Salish Sea. And that prompted the development and sort of organization of, of this new large scale project called the Salish Sea Marine Survival Project. Thanks, Liz. So the the project as a whole was, you know, developed over a couple of years and 
the key question that we were asking, it seems simple. This one key question, what affects the survival of young Chinook, Coho, and Steelhead in the Salish Sea during that early marine period where they are rearing? This project actually ended up being huge with many participants. You can see the numbers on the top banner, just the large number of entities, the collaboration that was occurring, and just the huge amount of fundraising that was necessary to sort of underpin such a, such a big interdisciplinary ecosystem-based program. At the end, you know, this ended up being more than the five years that we proposed the project would run for just because of the time to do the reporting out from the whole program. Um, but ultimately, uh, you know, a lot of work was done in a, in a way that we were addressing a large number of different hypotheses. Just to the next, please, Liz. <clears throat> So Long Live the Kings and Pacific Sun Foundation partnered to carry out this project and really depending on sort of the organization, the steering and the facilitation of this team and myself at that time. So in the middle was um, Dr. Brian Riddle was sort of, you know, implemented this project, had been thinking about it for many, many years. And then um, he was the CEO at, at PSF at that time, and I was the coordinator for this Salish Sea project. And we were working very closely with Michael Schmidt, who's on the right, um, who was at that time the deputy director for Long Live the Kings, and Iris Kemp, who was a senior scientist. And this was a really amazing team to work with. And at this point, we are very grateful to all of them. They've all moved on to different things now, but we are hoping that by continuing our collaborative work that we are really sort of advancing the legacy that they all helped to create. Next, please. So this picture is just a snapshot. Um, you know, this truly was collaborative. This was not Long Live the Kings and PSF. It was many, many different groups. And there was a huge variety of, of different groups that were involved from sort of state and federal entities, local entities and agencies, um, First Nations in BC, and then Native American tribes. Many different nonprofits were, were a part of this. Um, academia, to a very high extent, we had a large number of postdocs and professors and master students involved, and private corporations. And a lot of these were also providing funding as well as services and people energy into the project. And of course, nothing can happen without an awful lot of funding. Um, and that funding really did begin with seed funding to the tune of 5 million that was um, provided through the Pacific Salmon Commission. And that really, you know, was the start of, of a massive fundraising campaign on both sides of the border, which was a pretty significant thing for two nonprofits to pull off um, something that to this day now is probably a $40 million effort. Thanks. So the next part is to look at, you know, what we learned from the project. Let's go to the next slide. This was an infographic that was put together when we were reporting out on the project. This is trying to find a very simple way to depict what was an extraordinarily large number of studies and findings. And this infographic really just shows, you know, the, the typical pattern of decline from, you know, young salmon coming out of rivers, moving into the Salish Sea. So that is sort of the turquoise component of this infographic, and then carrying on through the life cycle into the open ocean and finally returning. This shows the typical decline and then the key factors that the transboundary committee and the technical committees um, showed uh, during the, the sort of research component to be the key factors that were, you know, the reasons that we believe this decline has been occurring within these regions. So there were, you know, several things that really popped out. And when we look at this infographic, we can see in the deep red that food supply and predation really are the highest impact factors. So these two factors are showing up as bright red. They came out uh, through a weight of evidence approach by the technical committees and the scientists in our transboundary teams as the key factors. Changes in food supply, when we look at that, there's a larger circle to the right, which is you know what were the factors that underpin those issues? And the biggest one of all 
uh, changes as a result of climate change to food availability. And this can involve, you know, availability in time, availability in space, and then the quality and quantity of food all being impacted by climate change, which is also then impacting, you know, mismatch in timing of when it's available to young fish that need the food to grow large enough to, to survive their entire next steps um, out in the open ocean. And then the second key factor was around pinniped predation primarily, although there were other uh, predators that were looked at during the program. Pinniped populations have increased hugely within the Salish Sea. So the key big red one there was uh, harbor seals. But then these secondary factors that are in the amber, you know, were things like, you know, what is the availability of forage fish and herring and, and anchovies and other species that may be preferred and of value to harbor seals, which could then, you know, if they are in decline, lead to more impacts on juvenile salmon. So these really were the two um, factors that sort of rose to the top, but then there were many other factors. So in reality, there wasn't a simple story or a simple smoking gun. I don't think we ever thought there would be, but you know, there are many other sort of contributing factors to this story. So in the pink there, we have contaminants and disease issues, which showed up as secondarily important factors and then others such as river flow and estuary health. Underpinning all of those factors though, is this change in climate and that we're seeing these changes throughout the food web occurring already in, in many different components. Next, please, Liz. Sorry, thanks. So when we looked at everything that came out from the program, there were a, a really massive number of recommendations. And so we're just going to go through four different groups of recommendations. And the first of those were applied actions that we wanted to make sure would be continued that could really address the sources of mortality. And the first set of those were these, these group that in many ways are focused on the predation issue. So river flows right from the very beginning was clearly related to higher rates of loss. And when we started looking at that, we did see that there were um, other species such as herons and birds that are feeding on um, juvenile fish and are particularly good at feeding on them when river flow is low. So flow came out as a pretty important one. As I said before, you know, looking at herring, not only is that truly vital as a, as a food resource for these young Chinook and Coho, but it is also very important as a forage fish, you know, species that can assist in buffering the level of seal predation. And then the other part of this is actually to look at direct strategies to reduce seal predation as that mortality was seen to be pretty high. The next group under applied actions were to really focus on the estuary and near shore habitat. This came out as a pretty important component. And by you know, restoring these habitats, we can really support the life history variability that we're looking at needing to support salmon resilience. And then the final group here was just to really focus on health. Health um, was a big part of this, looking at the disease impacts and trying to reduce these toxic and uh, contaminant um, hotspots. Oh. The next set of recommendations were around science and monitoring. So really wanting to you know, continue critical science, fill knowledge gaps that came out of the, the project as a whole and improve our understanding of mechanisms that are impacting survival. And to do that, it was seen as very significant that we should maintain and, um, you know, really speak to the, the value and the need for long term monitoring. And then the next group there were to, you know, continue to test strategies um, and different kinds of ways that we could build new approaches, new innovation, new experimental approaches. Much of this was done during the Salish Sea project, but we really wanted to continue that work. And then the final one that came out as very important was to make sure that data were openly available and, and to really improve accessibility to data as a whole throughout the Salish Sea. Next. The next set of recommendations were around planning and adaptive management. And so the first one of these 
was really to use, you know, the knowledge that we had been creating throughout the project and that's continued to evolve um, since to improve forecasting and modeling. And then the second point was to really incorporate climate change. Um, and this has to be explicitly accounted for in our recovery plans and management actions. And then the final set of recommendations were around outreach and education. So firstly, we just wanted to expand the, the work that we are doing. We heard from many people, they just want more science. They want to understand what's being done. So we've really done a focused effort, I think, as we have moved forward to, to improve the, the different kinds of products that we're creating and the communication with many different groups to get information out to much broader audiences. We also wanted to strengthen that international community of researchers that you know we have tried so hard to build over the years and wanting to maintain that, that cross-border transfer of information and just good energy actually as a whole. And you know, we were thinking at the beginning coming out of SS SSMSP that it would be good to actually support some kind of formal transboundary structure and you know the Salish Sea Institute had been suggested as a, a potential location to house that that hasn't fully occurred but we have definitely wanted to create you know the momentum and the energy that came out of the project and so Liz will be speaking to what we we are trying to continue so that we can actually just keep facilitating um, this kind of strong connectivity and transfer of information um, across border and disciplines that's fine, don't worry, Liz, next one's fine. Um, yeah, and so these are the products that came out. They were really fully completed, I think in 2021. There is a really huge synthesis report, all of these different sort of outputs from the project when it was sort of, you know, coming to its formal conclusions, they've all been put out on the Marine Survival website, which is shown there on the bottom right. So the full synthesis report is, is very long and very detailed, but trying really to find a place to house everything that we, or as best we could, what we learned and, and pointing to all the publications from the many partners. And there is a much shorter version of that. I think it's 21 pages. It's maybe a lot more digestible for many people. It's on the same website. And then these other pieces that we created, um, internally around you know what was the actual approach that we used and how do we apply that to to actually carry out something that was this collaborative and ecosystem based and then the final one was really focused on the sort of monitoring that was carried out and and hopefully continued and required and the different uh, research techniques that were tried because many new things were applied during this project and uh, these are in this third document next thanks so you know this did conclude our official sssmsp project did conclude in 2021 with the publication of those documents and um but that wasn't the end of things you know there was huge momentum coming from the salish sea project large numbers of you know recommendations as you just saw but also gaps you know of information that we wanted to fill lots of questions coming out and so at the pacific salmon foundation you know, this marine science program was developed um, in response to everything that came out of SSMSP. And this is just a poster um, that Nicole, staff member, made um, just to give an overview of what we're doing at the marine science program. And it has some of the key initiatives that we are now continuing. And when we look at those, you know, there's a whole range of different things. In the middle, we have citizen science projects. These are ways that we're doing and continuing a lot of monitoring at, in a very cost-effective way. We have our data center, really trying to push for the open data and information out. Um, you know, we have work that's ongoing through our nearshore and estuary projects and our resilient coast for salmon, which is very much focused on, you know, nearshore health and, you um, basically, you know, helping these ecosystems adapt to climate change and be more resilient as a whole for salmon. And then, you know, we've got a hatchery effectiveness review and a bottlenecks of survival project that's very much looking at what are the key bottlenecks and, and where and when, you know, are we losing fish in that early marine period and over that first winter? And, you know, what are the differences between hatchery and wild fish and other things that we can do 
uh, to help. And then different projects that we're looking at salmon and herring interactions. And then we also have a salmon and seal interactions program. So a lot of work is continuing, you know, building on that SSMSP momentum. And then over to you, Liz, for the Long Live the Kings piece. Well, thanks, Isabel, for that great overview. Um, as I wasn't really around for the actual marine survival project, I really appreciate having your history with it and depth to better explain it. Um, and like you said, um, as although the marine survival project had officially come to a close, it really drove the work that Long Live the Kings is continuing to do today. When we were developing our 2025 strategic roadmap, all our recovery goals were built based on the findings and recommendations of the Marine Survival Project. Um, and our four recovery goals are um, to lower mortality for salmon in the Salish Sea. And this includes projects focused on herring recovery and understanding food web interactions, addressing toxic hotspots and other um, similar projects. We are also focused on increasing Chinook diversity, which includes includes projects focused on estuary and nearshore habitat restoration and also some experimental work. We are looking to improve or remove barriers to migration, which includes some of our work around um, infrastructure and human-made barriers, in particular predation hotspots linked to bridges and barges. And lastly, um, working to inspire action through education, which is captured by our popular Survive the Sound game, which is aimed at engaging youth and the general public while educating them on the challenges facing steelhead and other salmon in the Salish Sea. So how did we get to the 2023 workshop? Well, while PSF and Long Live the Kings were, um, both shaped their ongoing programs around the findings of the Marine Survival Project, what has really been missing since the end of the Marine Survival Project has been um, these regular collaborations that really fueled this work and fueled this great momentum that was built. During the Marine Survival Project, participants were meeting in person at least annually and communicated regularly through technical teams and work groups. These smaller groups were typically guided by steering committees to keep them on track, and this whole process was supported by strong facilitation and dedicated funding. Um, but as the project was wrapping up, it was already impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, and the last official Marine Survival Project meeting was held on Zoom in late 2020. So as these findings were um, coming out and all this momentum had been created, we were really in this sort of middle zone of um, virtual interactions, and we also had a lot of shifts in personnel, mainly here at Long Live the Kings. So it took us a while to regroup together, PSF and Long Live the Kings, and figure out how we would work to um, keep this collaboration alive. And around mid-2022, we began meeting again and started planning ways to envision how the Marine Survival Project would um, sort of exist in this next phase. So the first step was to bring people back together for an in-person workshop. And this happened in May, this past May, 2023. We were able to have our first in-person gathering in three years, and this is thanks to funding from the Puget Sound Partnership. Um, the goals for this one and a half day workshop were to identify how science and findings from the Marine Survival Project are being advanced and implemented within Washington and British Columbia, as well as um, any transboundary implementation. And we also wanted to identify priorities for research, action, and opportunities to continue um, transboundary collaboration. The format of our workshop included presentations from nearly all of the attendees, which as Isabel mentioned, were some of the sort of original members of the Marine Survival Project um, technical groups and, and steering committee as well as new faces that had carried on that work. Um, we also had daily breakout group discussions and um, social events. So have, trying to capture three years of advancements and what people have been doing was a tall task. And really the bulk of this meeting was dedicated to sort of high level updates from each of the individual attendees, which made for about 27 presentations and a lot of information. So it's hard to distill 
everything we learned into a few um, concise bullet points. But for now, we wanted to give you a taste of some of the main takeaways. As far as science and advanced science advancements, there have been a lot. There's been a lot of dedicated work to advance our knowledge around the individual stressors impacting salmon. And really, that has helped us refine our detailed understanding around things like toxics and disease and other factors. Um, but we know that to really make progress on understanding how those factors then interact and are ultimately impacting salmon, there was um, a lot of emphasis on the need for long-term monitoring and those long-term data sets that can help incorporate the impacts of climate and interact, interactions between salmon, their predators, and prey. It was also exciting to see how citizen science is really helping to support monitoring and advance the science. And I'll pass it to Isabel to explain an example of that work being conducted in British Columbia. Thanks, Liz. Yeah, I mentioned before that um, we have some citizen science programs as part of our marine science program. And the one that has been running for the longest, nine years now, is our citizen science oceanographic monitoring program. This was begun for the Salish Sea project and uh, really wanting to find a way to monitor the entire Strait of Georgia and understand what's happening to uh, oceanographic parameters. And that will help us understand those whole bottom up shifts, you know, from the oceanography through the, through the food web up to salmon. So this program was developed using um, different communities, um, going to different communities and finding local citizens retirees, old fishermen, whatever it might be, people that just had a genuine interest in being involved and going out there with their own boats, which we basically, you know, kitted out into being these mo mobile oceanographic platforms. And they go out about 22 or so times a year. They've done this now for nine years. The people up on that top right hand corner have been there since day one. Uh, they've really stuck with the program and, and the data that they're they're collecting using CTDs and, and picking up information on biotoxins and harmful algal blooms and looking at nutrients and sometimes testing other things such as ocean acidity um, has been just an amazing uh, data set that has built over the years. It's many thousands of observations and data points and and all of that is helping us uh, gain an understanding of, you know, how is this environment being impacted by climate change and marine heat waves? And now to look at things like other areas of refuge that should be protected, are there particular hotspots that are very difficult for re as rearing areas? And how does all of this information help us understand, you know, what's going on um, within the food web? This is a really cost effective way to have a very high spatial and temporal coverage. So it has been excellent and is one of many different projects that we have using community groups. Thanks, Liz. All right. Thank you, Isabel. And then another thing we wanted to highlight was that it, um, we were encouraged to see there was a more frequent pairing of indigenous knowledge and Western science in research efforts and solutions. And one project I wanted to highlight was work that Long Live the Kings and the Nisqually Indian tribe, the Port Gamble Skalm tribe and other partners have been doing together to test indigenous methods to recover herring populations in Puget Sound, including the use of the evergreen trees and, and boughs that you see here that were placed um, in a known uh, um, herring spawning habitat to see if they could act as supplemental spawning habitat and help us um, understand uh, population. We're also looking to understand population um, structure and that will help us recover salmon population. So uh, in terms of the implementation of findings, um, we were intrigued to learn about uh, a lot of the advancements that have been made to models, um, including end-to-end -end and ecosystem models like Atlantis that are, have, were developed as part of the um, Marine Survival Project that have, but are being improved and refined to better um, guide adaptive management. There are also a lot of promising new tools and technologies that are supporting these advancements, including work with omics, remote sensing, chemical tracers, and other technologies that have really been developed, uh, have been 
developed even more since the Marine Survival Project and and further, um, there's a lot of innovating and collaborative approaches around climate resiliency. And again, I'll turn to um, Isabel to highlight another example in BC. Thanks, Liz. Yeah, so we've been doing a lot of work under our Nature on Estuary program um, at PSF and funding groups. Um, there are a lot of people doing uh, kelp work now. We also do a lot of work in eelgrass. And in terms of thinking about resiliency, some of this has come from Mesa Ocasio Lab at the University of Victoria. She has been using satellite methodologies for many years now to really track and understand changes in, in kelp distribution and resiliency and identifying those conditions that are most important for resiliency. And the hope is that with this kind of information, we can better understand you know, where our restoration efforts will be most successful rather than trying to restore in a region where there's just no hope of kelp being able to persist. Um, we're also doing work to look at you know, different methods for restoration, like the middle picture around green gravel, looking at the genetic mixes that would be best suited and most successful for restoration looking at efforts to you know determine which are the most thermal tolerant strains of kelp and then finding methods that um, allow us to biobank those so on the right hand side um, this is a team out of simon fraser university who have actually developed the cryopreservation methods for biobanking kelp and uh, they've been focused on bull kelp but want to expand to many other macroalgae and um, the hope here is that, you know, if you can identify these very tolerant strains, heat tolerant strains, that you can then biobank those and those would be successful or more successful for restoration projects. And they are moving into actually doing some trials to promote or even force, you know, a, a level of thermal tolerance by exposing kelp to very high temperatures and trying to force, you know, changes in gene expression that could then be passed on. So, again, these are just different ways that we're trying to, to find methods and ways to, to uh, promote and restore kelp and other habitat for uh, juvenile Pacific salmon. Thanks, Liz. Uh, thanks. And we the last thing for implementation that we were excited to hear about was some of the many ways people are actively testing um, solutions to some of the challenges that salmon are facing in the Salish Sea. And one example is work that Long Live the Kings, NOAA, and the Port Gamble Scallum tribe are doing at the Hood Canal Bridge. Um, during the Marine Survival Project, it was discovered that the bridge is acting as a predation hotspot for steelhead by sort of um, slowing and stopping them there and making it easy for pinnipeds to um, really feast on them at that at that bridge, largely based on how they are, they migrate very close to the surface. And um, out of that work, when thinking about solutions, the problem really appeared to be at the hard corners that the bridge makes. And so over um, collaborative work, um, the, these groups have developed a design to uh, for a fish, fish guidance structure that will hopefully um, make it easier for the steelhead to navigate these hard corners and safely and more quickly pass through the bridge. And um, this, these, it's a rather massive structure <laughs> that was built and put into the water for the first time last spring and was tested in April and May during the steelhead out migration last year um, in a controlled experiment. So there were, it was a week where the fish guidance structure would be put on the bridge and then a week without it and look at we're looking at mortality during those weeks to see if there's any impact to sort of alleviate this predation hotspot for steelhead. Uh, we don't have the results yet, but we're excited to um, really figure out what happened and also test this structure again um, coming this spring. Um, so along with the many advancements and areas where findings are being impl implemented, we did learn that there are still gaps and opportunities for research, action, and collaboration. Specifically, most people felt that climate change is still not adequately being addressed and integrated into current work. 
And although we've made big strides in understanding the specific factors and a little learning more about their own details, we still need to do a better job to connect those dots and link the factors to understand really the mechanisms that are impacting survival. This includes looking at how impacts integrate and affect stage specific survival through the full life cycle, um, including knowing how impacts that happen before fish enter the Sailor Sea and after their time in the Sailor Sea are sort of um, affecting their lifetime mortality or maybe delayed, um, have delayed mortality impacts. And there's also still a need to support and maintain long term monitoring and these long to help build these long term monitoring data sets. Um, one example is like the offshore juvenile salmon and monitoring surveys that DFO has been conducting in the Strait of Georgia since, since 1997. And if you were at last month's um, Sailor Sea Science Roundtable, you saw Chris Neville present on um, the work and findings that have come out of that long-term monitoring data set. And you can see how important it's been to understand shifts in marine survival um, specifically for the shifts in marine survival of coho that she featured and showing how those are linked to shifts in food supply. Um, however, there is not yet a comparable offshore monitoring prog program for Puget Sound. Um, currently, Long Live the Kings is working with the Tulalip tribes to help establish an offshore monitoring program for juvenile salmon and herring that would be you know, similar to the program being conducted in the Strait of Georgia. And this type of consistent offshore monitoring of um, fish population, salmon populations when combined with long-term monitoring of water quality and zooplankton and the environment will really help us better understand these linkages between climate, prey, and salmon growth and survival and how that's impacted by climate change. And lastly, data from these long-term monitoring programs and other efforts are most useful when they are shared and accessible. And we still have more to work to do on that front. And again, I'm turning it to Isabel to feature um, how this is being tackled in British Columbia. For sure. So um, when we were sort of envisaging, you know, visioning the whole Salish Sea project and on what would be involved, one of the first things that we did was to design and set up the Strait of Georgia Data Center through the Pacific Salmon Foundation and UBC. So this was probably happening in 2012 when we were just starting to scope out what the SSMSP would look like. We knew that we would need um, you know, some data portal where we could have information for researchers and also as a, a location to put a lot of the data sets that were created during the research component of SSMSP. So this really is a, a marine data portal. It is for marine ecosystem data. At this point, it is focused on the Strait of Georgia. Um, the idea here is that this is an open access portal and a, a one-stop shop. You can go there. We are not trying to bring in all of the data or house it all if it's already in a database or an atlas or a data center or an open access portal, but we do make sure that there is clear metadata that can send you to the source of the information or at least the person that would have that information if it isn't openly available. And uh, these are all relevant data sets. You know, for the SSMSP, we continue to work on the, the Strait of Georgia data center and have expanded to all of these different components that are shown here in the list. Um, a lot of mapping work has been done. We have a marine reference guide with many like 450 spatial data layers for the, for the Strait of Georgia you know, researchers and what they're working on, publications. And so this is trying to create products, visualizations for a really wide range of uh, audiences. Uh, we have story maps to really explain a lot of our programs and the kind of value of the data that we're collecting. And here you just see a picture that we, we have created an atlas um, with the help of Rich Pavlovich at UBC and, and his students. And this is all of the data from that citizen science program that I mentioned earlier. And we have this online atlas. So all those data are available. And also there are a lot of different visualizations that can show you the year to year change and we can get a sense of, of what's actually happening. So this is, uh, you know, we hope is fairly easy to use and provides a, a lot of uh, wealth of information 
and um, we are in discussions and thoughts as to whether this should be expanded and have been pondering expansion to include, you know, south of the border. It seems to make sense to, to make this a Salish Sea, not just a Strait of Georgia uh, product, but we're also thinking of expanding to the west coast of Vancouver Island just because of many sort of sister projects now that, that provide us, you know, a lot of additional uh, comparative and, you know, important data. So, yeah, that's the data center. Thanks, Liz. All right, thanks, Isabel. And hold on. Um, and lastly, we wanted to touch on collaboration. In a lot of our feedback, in our discussion groups, we got feedback about how we should proceed with um, keeping this collaborative network alive. And one thing that clearly and unanimously was messaged to us was that everyone values transboundary collaboration. Um, this broad coalition of professional and community researchers across disciplines and borders that the Marine Survival Project had built was really important um, in people's minds to maintain and at this point really to reinvigorate to benefit both our science and recovery efforts. So these were the messages we heard about collaboration. One, more is better. Um, you know, every three years is not enough. We wanted, people wanted more opportunities for frequent um, chances to collaborate. Um, this would ha uh, could happen in a variety of ways. Some people preferred small groups that they could connect with more casually. There also was uh, interest in larger workshops um, and both a combination of virtual and in-person uh, options. It was really important that some of these collaborations involved social time because the, you know, what one thing that our um, workshop could have used more of was more chances for sort of unstructured discussions and social time. And that really helped to maintain those relationships and fuel breakthroughs and have creative um, thinking around um, future work and, and um, problem solving. Um, it was also emphasized that it really helps to have um, an organizer, like a convener, like here for this round table and, and facilitators. And that really helps to make sure that things don't get dropped and the collaboration stays alive. And as with anything, it's really helpful to have dedicated funding that only not only supports just casual uh, collaborations, but also funding sources that really prioritize and highlight a transboundary and collaborative projects of dedicated funding that would help support advancement. Um, so then lastly, we wanted to touch on what came out of this workshop and where we're at in terms of our next steps for the Marine Survival Project. Um, immediately after the workshop, we really focused on sort of digesting and summarizing what we learned. Direct outcomes include a workshop summary that you can find linked through the Marine Survival Project website and a little blurb that summarizes it. As also as part of the workshop, we developed sort of a pilot interactive map that summarizes um, work that's being continued and I'll discuss that in a little bit. And we also um, did some updates to our website, we updated, we have lists of publications of what's been produced and at least within the group, the presenters and invited attendees shared their presentations um, so that everyone could have more time to digest all these uh, many, many updates that they heard. This map that we developed um, is, our idea for it is that it would be a useful sort of communications piece and way to keep track of the work that's continuing to be done. Um, we designed it as an interactive map that displays um, project specific information and throughout the Salish Sea. And we, um, to get information to build this map, we had an online form that we had participants fill out. Um, and thanks to Ben Skinner at the data center, he took that information and helped build this map layer, um, similar to other map layers that he developed at the data center. So the goal of this map is to capture the breadth of the ongoing work throughout the Salish Sea. Each project or program 
um, is displayed as a point of the map. And each of these color, uh, each of these points can be one of four colors that correspond to those sort of high level groupings that um, we talked about how we organize the findings and recommendations. These groupings are the science and monitoring projects, applied tools and actions, planning and adaptive management or outreach and education. So just to show you an example, you can see project number 15 in Hood Canal. It's the green dot. That means that it's an applied tools and actions proje project. So if you, um, in the interactive map, if you go click on that dot, you'll get this pop out box that shows basic information about the project, which is called the Hood Canal Bridge Assessment Phase 2. And that's the one that I talked about where we're testing that um, fish passage structure to see if it reduces predation mortality for steelhead. And for right now, we decided to put very simple information, like a, a brief description, who's doing it, where it's being conducted, and who the contact is. But we did get more information. So this, depending on who it's being used for or what people are willing to share or want to know about, we could add information, um, more detailed information on things like the funders, the length of the study, the um, target species or other things that could be of interest. And what is also useful is that besides having it color coded and, and sort of orienting by types of projects, we could also um, make it so that you could sort of filter by uh, different of the factors that we display. Like you could look at projects all from one region, um, or you could look at, you could filter for projects that are only addressing habitat or you could filter for um, projects only being conducted by one agency. So there's many different ways that this could be useful. Um, I just want to emphasize this is sort of just an initial attempt. Um, and so depending on interest, we are looking to update it and um, make it useful to our collaborative network. And as for our next steps, our primary goal right now and for this workshop was to maintain the strong, this strong transboundary network and to increase collaboration. Um, for now, we're still sort of in the digesting and the early stages of figuring out how to do that and what that will look like. When we planned this workshop, we were really envisioning that our main work would be to host these biannual workshops. And we still um, tentatively plan to host another one in 2025, this time hosted in British Columbia, because we did find that this was useful and well received. But um, in terms of addressing the feedback that people want more frequent opportunities for collaboration, we did hear that people um, really were interested in monthly or quarterly seminars that um, were virtual and, you know, when <laughs> Scott approached us about presenting here, it seemed like you must have been at our workshop too, because the Salish Sea Science Roundtable really fits that bill. So we really want to thank the Puget Sound Institute and the partnership and DFO for providing this valuable collaborative outlet. And it's complete with facilitation and the organization, as well as a quarterly social events. And those were all like elements that came out as really strongly recommended. So very on point with our workshop recommendations. Thank you for that. Um, and also, in terms of the smaller scale um, types of collaboration people ask for, one suggestion was to uh, create sort of Slack channels or base camp sites for, um, you know, particular themed groups, like the modelers who could have their own Slack channel and be able to have those more frequent casual interactions um, around project questions or upcoming events. So that's something um, that we may look into, see if we have a role in helping facilitate that. And there is also um, sort of interest in having some sort of written update or at least an annual data update. So one idea would be to have a dedicated newsletter just for sort of Marine Survival Project newsletter update. Um, or it could be a blurb in an existing newsletter, for instance, PSF has a marine science newsletter, and we could have a little box every quarter that gives a little marine survival project update. So that was one idea people talked about. Um, or maybe it would be an annual um, report that really sort of summarizes the state of the Salish Sea and really gives 
um, an update to the latest data and consensus on um, sort of adding another data point to that long term picture, uh, adding another data point for the annual marine survival trends or that year's water conditions. That obviously would take a lot more effort, but that was something people um, expressed some interest in as well. And that's where we are now. We have a lot of feedback. There's a lot of exciting work still going on. We were all very grateful for the opportunity to meet in person again. And, um, and Isabel and PSF and myself and the Long Live the King team is really excited to keep that momentum going and figure out continuing ways to engage this transboundary network. So we really appreciate um, uh, the opportunity to speak to you all today. Thanks for listening. And we're happy to answer any of your questions. Although I realize we haven't left you too much time. So I apologize for that. No worries. Thank you very much. Um, feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question or to drop it in the chat. Um, Isabel, I know you responded to one, but just so that others can hear, do you mind speaking to this question about um, pinniped reduction and some of the specific strategies? Yeah, I think the question was around the, maybe it was on one of the slides that I was speaking to regarding the recommendations around dealing with pinniped uh, predation and thinking of strategies to deal with that. It wasn't around reducing pinniped populations in that recommendation, but actually doing something about uh, predation and can we help the situation because they can be quite high, particularly up in the Strait of Georgia for Coho and Chinook. Some of the modeling work suggested pretty high losses of juvenile. Uh, juveniles there and also for steelhead in Puget Sound. So, um, you know, they were asking, have culls been brought up as an option if we're looking at reducing predator numbers? And I was just saying that, you know, I don't think that our focus was on reducing predator numbers, but of course, culling has been brought up by many people. And, you know, there are some First Nations in BC, I think that would be <laughs> that. I mean, it's definitely come up with lots of different groups. So, um, but I think at PSF for the work that we're doing, we're more focused on what are the anthropogenic factors that you know we have created as uh, you know human beings that are making things worse for juvenile salmon, and can we do something about those things to better their situation? And that is where we're focused on things like um, you know increasing complexity in those near shore rearing areas or um, you know, removal or dealing with pinch points where we may have fish particularly facing issues, particularly in lower rivers when there's low flows. So again, back to that flow issue, um, when there's low flows and we often see fish milling and waiting to get into warm, shallow waters and having trouble with that, they become you know, very easy pickings for seals. So I think there's a lot we can do around that. The other things that, are, that we've been looking at are log booms, which really do seem to be, you know, seal feeding platforms, never mind all the other damage that they create, but basically seals like to haul out on them. They are very protected then um, with changing tides. So if they would be on a normal rocky haul out, they would be washed off when the tide was high, but on a, you know, a little log boom, they can sit there and they can pop and everybody is safe. And so, you know, they themselves are protected from uh, transient killer whales, um, which may otherwise be a problem for them. So this is sort of changing the whole balance. And I think that we are in a lot of conversations and, you know, with some of the the uh, groups, the First Nation groups that have a lot of concern about this, um, that are very focused on trying to get those log booms out of waters when young fish are coming out or when the adults are returning uh, to help with that situation. And then the work that we're doing on both sides of the border around, you know, looking at protection and understanding, you know, forage fish spawning habitats in general. We have a large monitoring program in BC for uh, forage fish. And this is another citizen science program. Like, where are they spawning and can we protect those beaches and make sure that they don't become damaged? We know that buffer fish can do a lot for reducing predation on, on these juvenile uh, salmon, salmonids. So if we can improve conditions for buffer prey, including herring, then that will help too. And and then the work that Liz was talking to as well. So I think that's more of where our focus is than you know coming up with culling plans. But um, obviously that has been suggested by by groups as an option. I think that kind of covers my 
my answer to that one. Great. Really appreciate the thoughtfulness in that. All right. I don't see a hand. So Scott, I'm going to give you the final question before we wrap up. Okay. And I don't mean to like not, not involve you, Liz, but I'm really interested in the Strait of Georgia data center. I, I participated in an inter interactive poster at the 2022 Sailor Sea Ecosystem Conference. And I love the idea that that could grow to be Sailor Sea. So what, Isabel, what might be a a step, a next step to join you in those conversations? Yeah, we're to we are totally open to this. We've been doing a lot of internal planning with the data center as a whole. We have never clipped our data anyway, you know, right from the very beginning. It wasn't like we were just trying to make sure we only got the Strait of Georgia in terms of the sort of aerial coverage. But um, so, you know, I'm sure there are many different data sets already in there that are much more expensive than just the straight, but we, we are pretty certain that, you know, there will be expansion with respect to, you know, at the very beginning of the SSMSP project, I think we just, we felt that there were other platforms that were being developed or, or that would serve the purpose. So we didn't want to overstep, but it just keeps coming up. So if there is, you know, an interest and there are groups that would be keen to see this happen, we're very open to having those discussions. And I just get in touch with me and then I can have the data center team. We're a bit of an expanding team right now. Um, we brought in a few new people recently. It just seems like it is just such a, a, a very useful and nicely laid out uh, platform. And, and we'd be really happy to to look at ways that we can can expand. So yeah, I just use me as a point of contact right now, and I can definitely bring bring together the team to look at how we can do that. And a lot of the data, like with the Atlantis modeling work and all the work that uh, Catherine Sobosinski did, you know, there's huge amount. I mean, everybody, there's so much information. I don't, I think it would be a, a great thing to do. So open, very open. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that. And I see in the chat lots of interest from others on that topic in particular. So that's great. Um, if folks have questions that we didn't get a chance to get to, please feel free to email me um, and we can follow up from there. Again, we'll post presentation and recordings on the web page in the next couple of days um, and hope that you all can join us next Tuesday at Stoop Brewing for the happy hour. FYI, we will not have a roundtable in January since January 2nd seems like a uh, not a lot of people may be in the office. So we'll continue conversations again in February. But thank you so much, Liz and Isabel. Wonderful update and great to see how the science is evolving. Thanks very much. Really enjoyed it.